everybody. Welcome back to the Who's Your Band podcast. Uh, we are joined today by uh, this guy has, uh, he's been on General Hospital. He's been on The Bold and the Beautiful. He is uh, Mike Barnes from Karate Kid Part 3. And currently, currently, he's playing Sam Steven, not Stevens, Sam Steven on Amazon Prime's Studio City, which we are going to get into. We welcome Sean Kanan. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, pleasure. And we also joining us today, he is the host of the Cobra Kai podcast. He is a <laughs> headlining comedian in his own right, okay? And he has less hair than Sean Morton. Give it up <laughs> for Ryan Marr. I got to cut you off there, Jeff. It's not a, it's not the Cobra Kai podcast. It's a, it's a recap podcast called kicking it Cobra Kai where every week my, my co-host PJ Wendell and myself, we, uh, we take two episodes from the show. We storyboard it, we recap it and we take comments and questions. It's on Facebook live, but thank you. Kicking it Cobra Kai. And thank it's you great for making me feel bad. Jeff. Okay. Sean, uh, Sean and Sean. And we have, and of course doing double duty again, Sean Morton. It's it's Sam Stevens. It is Sam Stevens. He's a fucking moron, just so you know, Sean. <laughs> this, this is what I deal with every week. Okay. Okay, well, listen, I like the show at least. Give me some credit for that. It's, Studio City is, is very interesting. Yeah, your, your character, Steven Sams, is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get into this a little bit. And before we get into all that, let's let's talk about Sean's upbringing. Sean, you're originally from Cleveland. I was born in Cleveland. I left when I was five, uh, moved to uh, Newcastle, Pennsylvania, uh, about 40 miles west of Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, it was a town of about 25,000 people, kind of an industrial town. It was, it was weird. It was an industrial town, but then we lived in the, uh, the suburbs and we're like five miles from the Amish people. So it'd be like nothing to see somebody going by in a horse and buggy. And it, it was interesting. Um, left there and uh, went to school in Boston, Boston University uh, for two years. And then transferred out to UCLA to finish my degree in political science. Okay. So as a kid growing up, were you playing sports? Were you an athlete? Or were you more of like a theater uh, geek? I was, I was definitely not a theater geek. Um, I, uh, I was very involved in martial arts. From the time I was about, probably about 15 years old, that was my thing. That, you know, I... You know, as a young kid, I, uh, I, I got bullied, um, I, you know, I was, I was, I was kind of awkward and uh, I got into martial arts and really sort of, sort of found myself a little through that, you know, gained self-confidence, all that good stuff, so. Okay, so you go out, so you, you just answer, kind of answer the question, you go out to uh, California for college uh -huh. and you, is, when did you decide to get into acting? You know, when I was growing up, like I said, I was in a small town. I think when you're in a small town, you tend to look outward to the world for... Uh, tell you something. You're a very ugly guy, okay? You're, you're, you're very unattractive. And so I could, I could see you maybe get into acting to try and get girls, because there's no other way you would have gotten girls any other way. <laughs> Listen, I'll send you some pictures. You'll, you'll definitely see the, uh, yeah. the uh, awkward face. No, you know, I, this I, guy I, is 65 years old. Look the way he fucking looks. He looks better than 20-something year olds. Okay. <laughs> he, he he's awkward. My heart breaks for you, Sean. Look at me. I'm 27. <laughs> I'm gonna be 54 next month. Yeah. Uh, anyway, anyways. you know, I uh, I knew I wanted to be an actor when I was around 15 years old. I didn't really know what that would look like or how I'd go about doing it. Uh, I just knew I had to make my, my way to New York or LA. And you know, eventually in 1987, I did. Okay, so you get your big break actually playing Mike Bond, right? Is that your first time on film? No, unfortunately it wasn't. My first time on film was an utterly horrendous horror film that my, my manager begged me not to do. And I had never done any professional work. And I was like, look, I got to get my feet wet. I got to do something. And, uh, 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 you know, it, it was just, it was just a, a colossally bad movie. Um, so I wish I could say Karate Kid was my first film, but it wasn't. It was actually my second. Now, Ryan, did you see Karate Kid 3? Yeah, well, I was born in 1983. I think the original Karate Kid was 84, uh, and then uh, Karate Kid 3 was 89. So I don't remember a time in my life where I wasn't a fan of the Karate Kid films. Um, the question that I wanted to ask Sean, though, was, you know, you get Karate Kid 3. Were you a fan of those, you know, prior two films? And also, 
the critics weren't kind to Karate Kid 3. I loved it. But now with Cobra Kai and everything going on, you know, there's always these questions about, you know, where's Terry Silver? Where's Mike Barnes? Was it a surprise to you after, you know, the critics had panned the movie to see how beloved the film really is amongst that, you know, fan universe? Ryan, if you could ask more questions. There were like 75 questions. Be <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to handle them chronologically as well as alphabetically. Um, no, I, yeah, I was a fan. <laughs> it was surreal for me because, you know, I was like a pain uh, customer who bought a ticket for the first two and then suddenly there I am on the back lot of the studio filming with you know uh, Ralph Macchio uh, you know Pat Morita and uh, audition Martin Cook I yeah I had to audition I got it from an open call actually wow um, they had this big open call that was really supposed to be a publicity stunt I mean you know the chances of finding one of your lead actors for a highly successful uh, existing franchise through an open call just doesn't happen. So they had this open call and uh, I, I showed up, there were like 1,500, 2,000 people in line. And uh, you know, John Abelson, who had won the Academy Award for Rocky and right. directed the first two Karate Kid films, was making his way up this, this long line of people and I knew I had a couple seconds to get his attention. And I did and he said, okay, he said, let's do a little improv, intimidate me and I, I guess I did. and. Uh, they brought me inside to the soundstage um, and they had constructed a set and there's Ralph Macchio. And I'm looking at him going, wow, this is Ralph Macchio. And uh, you were intimidated. You know, here's the thing. I, I, I knew that if I kind of stepped foot into that scene as a guy that was a fan, as a guy that was, you know, look at the circus going on around me because they had like Entertainment Tonight, they had Access Hollywood. I mean, like I said, it was, it was a, you know, it was a publicity stunt. I, I knew I wouldn't get the role. I knew I had one singular thing that I needed to do, which was to intimidate Ralph Macchio in that moment. And, and I, I did. And, uh, I, I, you know, I knew I did well, but they wound up hiring somebody else for the role. And the guy worked for about a week and then they, they let him go. They fired him. And they remembered me and called me and, you know, they said, they said, come to the studio right now. And it was, again, surreal because, you know, they don't call you back to tell you you're not hired a second time. So I, I figured, okay, maybe there's like a buddy, there's a, a henchman or something like that. And uh, went to the office of the producer. There's John Abelson. There's Robert Mark Kamen, who had written the Karate Kid films as well as Taken and, and uh, The Transporter later, um, you know, big A-list writer. And uh, had me do a little, a few martial arts moves to make sure that I would I'd be able to do the choreography. And literally said, you're going to make this much money a week, now go to wardrobe. I mean, it was even more surreal. I mean, it wasn't like, hey, we start in a week. I mean, they had already started production and fired a guy. So they're already behind the eight ball. So I got it. it I is like when, when you work with like, a, like, I was in this movie, The Irishman. You know, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah, so I'm in this movie, The Irishman. And you, it's so weird because you're sitting across a table from Al Pacino, and behind you is Rob De Niro. And at the time, you're like, "Hey, man, we're the same at this point, okay?" But inside, you're busting. Like you can't believe like you're actually working with these guys. But like having, like having no right? right? Wish you would have seen as Pat Morita right now. Fucking dead <laughs> twenty years. That's what I wish. Lunch with Al Pacino. You know, Jeff, pass me the damn salt. I need it now. I mean, I can just <laughs> wait, who, wait, who are you just doing right there? That was Pacino. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> you were too busy putting yourself over still that you missed his whole impersonation. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I friend. Ryan, you don't know. <laughs> one is one I of us. A He's from, a comic uh, also. He's a comedian. Party. You know That's what? good. But show one other question that I, I had for you, and I promise I'll only do one this time. <laughs> there were a, there were a lot of rewrites to Karate Kid Three. Uh, I, I read somewhere in an interview that Martin Cove had, you know, a commitment to a, a show on CBS that only lasted one season. So that's why they had to write in Terry Silver. Uh, Robin Lively, who played the love interest, could no longer be the love interest because she was only seventeen. Were you already on board? And then they came to you and said, you know what? flip the script we're, we're doing something completely different or were you hired after all those changes were made no i must have been hired after all those because um uh thomas e griffith who played uh terry silver was already i think hired i'm I, okay 
Yeah, you know, um, I just I just knew that you know they weren't going to have this love relationship between uh, Daniel and Jessica. And I, listen, I you know I think a lot of the reason why the film got panned by a lot of uh, critics was that there were some structural problems in it that were curveballs that were kind of thrown at production. And you know, yeah. you know, you, you don't have a love interest for your lead character. You know, now you've got to kind of bifurcate the bad guys who was originally just supposed to be like Martin Cove's character, you know, kind of consolidated. I, I, I get it. Yeah. No, I mean, it's amazing they were able to pull off what they did considering all those last minute changes and curveballs. Uh, Sean, after that, mo after that movie, you kind of blow up. Do people come up and challenge you sometimes? Because you can kick some ass in real life. Um, you know, I've been really fortunate. Um, that hasn't happened very often. Um, I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but it hasn't happened very often. And, you know, listen, I, I've studied martial arts off and on for most of my life, but I'm really clear about the fact that, you know, look, I'm not Jean-Claude Van Damme. I'm not Chuck Norris. I'm, I'm an actor who loves martial arts. I've studied it. And, you know, I'm, I'm 54. I'm not looking to mix it up with anybody. You know, unless it's like, you know, protecting my family or fighting for my life. Those days are over. Um, most people are really, it's so funny. It's like, you know, I, I've been in bars and seen kind of some tough looking guys clocking me. And then they come up and they become like little kids and just want to talk about the film. And, you know, I'm sort of getting a little like, okay, what's going on? And they just come up and they're like, oh, my God, you're him. Can we, you know, and, and it's a part of so many people's childhood. And now with the success of Cobra Kai, um, they, they, you know, they replay all the Karate Kid original films and there's this whole new audience. So now it's a thing that's cross-generational. You know, you've got dads that are introducing their kids to it who've never even seen the Karate Kid movies. They just like Cobra Kai and then they rediscover the Karate Kid movies. So it, it's, it's, a, it's really amazing to 30 years later plus that, that this is still not only relevant, but relevant in my life. You were a very big ego. You're a very big boost to my ego the other day, Sean. Just so you know, how was um, that? I'm very lucky that my mother is still alive, and I'm very close with my mother. But she doesn't give me any credit as far as my comedy career goes. She, I've, she, I've gotten credit one time when I was inducted into the Friars Club in New York, and I brought her to the induction, and she texted me and goes, "Wow, this is big," and I said, "Thank you." So then the other day, she goes, "What, what do you do with these podcasts that you do? You're doing so many podcasts," and I go. Well, I'll watch one once in a while. She goes, no, I have no no desire. Well, who's on next week? And I go, oh, my friend Ryan Mars is on, and uh, I have an actor, uh, Sean Kanan. And when I'm even blinking an eye, she goes, AJ Quartermain? <laughs> and I went, yeah. Mom, thank you. And she's like, oh, I am definitely watching that one. I'm, I'm not watching anything else. So don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not committing to anything else, but I am watching this one. You know, I, I've been really fortunate in my career that I've stepped into a couple projects that have this entire huge history that follows them. You know, you, you know, General Hospital started as a, a, a radio show and then became a black and white soap opera, and it's been on for over fifty years. So, you know, you you get a contract role on a show like that within like a month of airing. There are millions and millions of people that have been fans of the show that now know who you are. And then I did Bold and the Beautiful, which is the most syndicated show in the world. Syndicated, it, at one point, I think it was in over 100 countries. You know, you step into that and suddenly it becomes worldwide, like Karate Kid. And, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I have no illusions that it's, it's me. It's, I've been very fortunate to kind of grab the coattails of some, some well-known uh, projects that, that, you know, have kind of really put me out there and introduce me to people. What's the taping schedule like for a soap opera? I've always wondered that since they're always like, it's, it's never on repeats. So here's, okay, so here's the deal. There's, there's a bit of a, a misunderstanding. We, when we work, we work very, very hard and long hours, okay? But when I was on Bold the Beautiful, for instance, we always had Mondays off. So we only had production for four days. We had a month off uh, for Christmas and New Year's. We had a month off in the summer, okay? Um, but when you're working, you're doing not just one show a day, but you're doing one show and parts of other shows so that when we're on hiatus and somebody turns the TV on, there's a show every single day. So consequently, when you're working, you know, in a film, you might shoot seven, eight, nine pages a day, uh, on a soap opera, 
you know, the production would shoot 80 pages a day, 90 pages a day, which means, you know, for me, my character, I'd probably have 20, sometimes 25 pages of dialogue. It's a lot. Did it prohibit you from uh, getting film work? No, because I, I had, I had, I was lucky. I had outs in my contract, right? You know, I negotiated those so that I could uh, uh, go do that. Uh, but also, like I said, you know, you've got two months off uh, when you can do whatever you want. Those those two months. So um, no, I was I was fortunate. I was able to do other stuff. Okay, and you also got to work with um, Billy Bob Thornton in a short-lived version of The Outsiders. Do you remember that, Ryan? Yeah, you know, I I, I grew up reading S. E. Hinton's books. Yeah, he wrote. Uh, the Outsiders, Rumblefish, that was then, this is now. Uh, uh, ironically, Ralph Macchio was one of the stars of uh, The Outsiders. And so Francis Ford Coppola was producing uh, uh, a television version for Fox of The Outsiders. And uh, I had auditioned for one of the greasers, I think. And they were like, you know, you, you kind of look a little too clean cut right now. And so they had this other part, the leader of the rich kids gang, the Sochiques. And I, I got that role and it was, it was so cool because yeah, we had great people on the show, Billy Bob Thornton and lots and lots of other people, but I'll never forget. We did this big rumble scene, which I had read about in the book. You know, it's like all the rich kids come in with their Corvairs and all their cool Mustangs and things. And then you see the greasers come in with their beat to crap cars and there's oil barrels with fire. And then the leader of the greasers walks up and then I walk up and we look at each other and then we boom, and we start the fight and then it's, then it's on. And it was, it was amazing because it, it, it was a lot like playing, I don't know, almost like playing dress up when you're a kid because I had such an idea of what it was going to be like. And I was so jazzed to be doing it because I, I grew up on those books. So now Ralph Macchio was only like 64 years old when he filmed the outsiders. Too. <laughs> I'm social security. I just wanted to go back to the soap opera thing for a minute. Sean had mentioned how, you know, his mother was so excited and, and she mentioned you by your character's name. Have you ever been involved in any of these soap opera meet and greets uh, that go on? There's, yeah, because there's a comedy club that Sean and I used to work at that, that used to do a lot of these soap opera meet and greets. And I remember the owner of the club called me up one time and he said, listen, he goes, uh, I'll throw you a hundred bucks. Do you want to do security? And I said, security, why do you need security? It's women in their fifties. And then when I got there, it was Steve Burton who was doing the meet and greet. And I realized, holy. Was this the brokerage? Uh, no, that's one of the clubs that did it. This was a different club, but it, I, I'm assuming it's the same thing everywhere you go. I mean, for one of the general hospital meet and greets and, and forgive me, I forget the actress's name, but her character was pregnant on the show. The actress was not pregnant. And people were bringing this woman baby clothes. And I'm like, holy <laughs> shit, what is going on here? I mean, have you encountered any crazy soap fans or have any funny stories about that? You know, listen, soap fans are amazing. I mean, I mean, a lot like the Karate Kid Universe fans. I mean, they are loyal mm -hmm. and they are supportive and I, I love them. Um, not so much crazy from the fans, but I was doing a... I was doing an autograph signing thing one time at a big convention center and I'll never forget there was a, a line of people waiting to go get their uh, their autograph and this this guy who looked kind of like uh, he was from Duck Dynasty like a big sort of <laughs> intimidating hunter guy with a, a big beard and he says I made you present and he throws this camouflage hunting sort of onesie down on the table for me and I pick it up and there's bullet holes all through it. And he goes, I made it just for you. Oh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, security took him out of there. I mean, that was a little weird. Yeah, you know, you know, here's the thing. When you're, you know, when you're Brad Pitt or you're like a big film star, people have to shut up, go sit in the dark, pay $15 to watch you. And then when they see you at a restaurant, there's, there's sort of um, an invisible barrier that, that, you know, kind of, keeps them from necessarily running right up to you and talking to you. When you're in a soap opera, you know, it's free. You're on every day. People can tune you in while they're, they're doing their laundry and they feel like they know you. Yeah. And so they come right up to you and you don't have that sort of uh, buffer zone. And 99.9% and .9 of, of the people are extremely nice and they're wonderful and they just want a chance to say hi to somebody they recognize. But every now and then, you know, you get somebody that is, you know, they're, they're just, uh, sometimes you get people who are rude. Sometimes you get people that, you know, if, if, if you're in the middle of a really 
you know, important conversation with somebody at dinner and you don't stop what you're doing and give them attention. That's the one time that it's like, what an asshole this guy is. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. And so it's, <laughs> but listen, all in all, I wouldn't trade it. It ain't a bad gig. Now that's a good lead in to what you're doing now, because that's kind of like a scene in your new show uh, called um, uh, Studio yeah. City. Okay, and I get the feeling it's kind of autobiographical. There, you know, you're you're a soap opera star. Um, which 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 show was it that inspired you to do this? You know, and it's a very interesting cast. It, it was by kind, the way. Of, kind of an amalgamation of all the shows that I've done. I've actually done four soap operas. I've done General Hospital, Bold and the Beautiful, Young and the Restless, and uh, before it was canceled, I was on Sunset Beach. So, you know, they always and you know this Jeff as as a guy that writes comedy for you guys you write what you know, right? And I mean, there's nobody who is going to tell me what it's like to have worked in soap operas for 30 years, right? I, I know intrinsically what that experience is like on camera, off, care, uh, off camera. And so for over a decade, I've been trying to get this show made in different incarnations. And, uh, you know, it's so often when you see soap operas portrayed in the media, like in a film or something like that, the actors feel the necessity to engage in this like hyperbolic, overly dramatic acting as if to kind of wink to the camera and go, we know right now we're, we're acting in the soap opera, so we've got a kind of bad act. And it really pissed me off because, you know, some of the very best actors I know work in daytime and it's a tough medium. Um, you know, you're saying the same thing over and over and over again. There's, there's almost no action. It's all exposition. And, um, you know, you gotta, if somebody doesn't tune in Friday, you gotta say the same thing Monday so they know what's going on. So I wanted, to, I wanted to create a show to show what it's like being a guy starring on a soap opera. And, you know, from the outside, you think, okay, guy's on TV, he's making a gazillion dollars, he's, you know, got the goose that laid the golden egg. It's not really like that, you know? And I wanted to show that my character was a flawed guy. He deals with a lot of the same crap that we all do, everything from, you know, a, a crazy mother and and all sorts of issues that he has at work and, and off camera and and make it as real as possible, but with just sort of a, you know, a, a little goose for some humor. Um, I called up a bunch of my friends that I had worked with in daytime, uh, Tristan Rogers, um, uh, Patrika Darwin. Bob Scorpio. Yes, yeah, Sarah Joy Brown, uh, Carolyn Hennessy. Um, and I said, guys, I just, I need a favor. I need you to come do this show for me. And, you know, as an actor, you get asked to do freebies a lot for your friends. And generally you do them. And most of the time they're either not great or they never see the light of day. And it was a really interesting phenomenon to watch because my friends who got the script and then did the read through and showed up were like, we're on to something here. They were connected to it. It wasn't about, hey, I'm not really making any money or anything. They were they were invested. And especially like with Tristan Rogers, I said, you know, man, if you if you trust me on this, we're gonna create a character for you that is gonna show you in a light that's not Robert Scorpio, and I you're gonna win an Emmy. And you know, Tristan has been in the business for what, like 50 years and has never been nominated for an Emmy. And you know, Tristan and I are good friends. We you know, my wife's friends with with his wife, et cetera. And I said, just trust me on this, man. I said, I think I think we're going to bring this home for you. And he called me the night that he he won the Emmy, and he was he was crying. It was it was pretty amazing. It's it's an interesting. Uh, it's interesting for a lot of reasons. One, it brings you into a world that a lot of people aren't privy to. The backstage, like 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 the 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 scenes that I really like are between you and I guess the executive producer. The woman, <laughs> you know, she's. Yeah, she she is great. She's very cunty, and you know, towards you. But you, but you could also like when she's by herself, you could see her vulnerability. You could yeah. see the the stress on that. I like that. Um, I was not expecting the c word there. I like that. I'm <laughs> rubbing off on him. I, I, yeah, I, I just kind of thought yeah, this happens when you work with Sean Morton. And you, you you throw words like cunty around. Um, but it also what I like about it is shit, man. Fucking Turner Schofield. I, you know. Yeah, yeah. A, a so transgendered actor. So, she's so great in this, and that one scene when she's like sitting in the oh, he's sitting in that um that group. Yeah, tremendous. Yeah, well, you know, so Scott made history. He was the first tra is the first trans man ever nominated for an Emmy, which means that our show Studio City made history as the first show to ever have 
uh, a trans man nominated for an Emmy. And I just, I couldn't be prouder of Scott. He is one of the most fearless, uh, amazing individuals I, I know. I, I met him working on Bold the Beautiful and then uh, ran into him again when he was emceeing uh, a charity event. And I always kept him in the back of my mind. And, uh, you know, we knew we wanted to do some, we, we knew we wanted to do a show that dealt with some socially relevant issues, you know, but not in a way that beats you over the head where you, you feel like you're being moralized to and somebody's wagging their finger at you because I can't stand that crap, right? So, so you know, we, we got all these storylines. We deal with Me Too. We deal with, you know, uh, you know, we deal with ageism. One of the great things that I love about my character is, you know, I'm kind of no longer the young buck on the show. I'm now a guy that's, you know, in his late 40s. She lets 40. you know that. She lets okay. you know that plenty of times. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, you know, listen, we wrote that. I mean, specifically because, you, you know, it's a, young, it's a young man's game. And like, luckily, Sam's a real good actor, but, you know, he's, he's not really the guy that's going to be flashing his eight pack anymore. And so he's kind of recalibrating to this sort of new reality. And I like that because that's something that, that me as an actor, as you as you're maturing and getting older, you have to deal with. And it's even it's even worse for women. I mean, you know, in acting, you know, men tend to age more like fine wine with women. You know, if you haven't really hit it by the time you're 35, you know, it's like a it's like a 20 year period for most actresses before they can kind of reinvent themselves. And it's not fair and it's not right, but it is what it is. I'm yeah, glad you mentioned me too. How much have you noticed uh, soap operas, you know, changing? I, I don't really follow soap operas. I dated a girl who was a big fan of Young and the Restless. Have the storylines changed? I, I, I don't either because, you know, I haven't been on a soap opera since 2016. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't watch them. Um, I mean, the industry as a whole has changed. And like most things, and this always happens, um, look, there was, there's a lot about the Me Too movement that is good and right and necessary but i also think that there was a lot of collateral damage because suddenly there was no gradient everybody was either harvey weinstein or they weren't exactly. and people exactly. were losing their jobs and you know i mean it, it was almost like the salem witch trials i mean you know you're, you're accused of something and next thing you know somebody's being fired and it's like you know there's got to be some semblance of um you know, innocent until proven guilty, it's about blah, 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 blah. But it's an important enough issue, of course, that, you know, we wanted to deal with that, with that too. So I think we do really effectively uh, in the, uh, uh, the character of uh, Patrika Darbo, who plays my mother. And, um, you know, uh, she was, she along with Carolyn Hennessy were both nominated for Emmys. I was nominated for an Emmy. Um, uh, my wife and I were nominated for writing. I mean, you know, you know we just, you know, you know, you, you create this thing and, and you get it made. And right then and there, that's amazing because the odds are always stacked against anything ever getting made. And then you hope that people like it. And then when people like it, that's really fantastic, right? But then we got all these nominations that we never expected. I mean, you know, you, we, just, we just didn't expect them. And I'll tell you a funny thing. The day the Emmys were being announced, they announced them on Twitter. And we were watching. And for some reason, my Twitter feed's jacked up. And so I told my wife, I go, go, go online and they'll, they'll announce them. So she goes online, but she looks up last year's and she's looking for us. And she goes, we're not, we're not here. We got snubbed. We're out. And I was like, oh my God, I was, I was crushed. You know, I was really disappointed. And then I get this call from my friend from the East coast. And he's like, you got one, you got two, you got five, you got seven, you got eight. And I was like, I mean, I was, I, I was highly emotional. I mean, it was just like, I, I spent you know, well over a decade trying to get this made. Yeah, it's like you, your wife, and your daughter are all working on this, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. So my, my stepdaughter uh, uh, is in it. And, um, you know, I, I told her, I said, listen, this is my baby. And I said, I'm not giving you this role uh, to have you be a weak link. I mean, if you, if you want this, I'll facilitate you getting an audition. I'll do that for you. Who does she play? Uh, she plays a character named Delilah. I don't want to say. I know who she is. No, 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 no. I know. I know she is. I know. Oh, she, she, now. She I wasn't sure that was her stepdaughter. You know, she I, I just hope it wasn't this one. You know, no, the, just, just yeah, one. I just wanted to make sure she wasn't Isabella. No, she's not Isabella. No. <laughs> Where the fuck did you get Isabella? Holy! <laughs> you, wow. 
Well yeah. done, sir. Well done with well, the casting. I would love to take credit for that, but our uh, illustrious director, Timothy Woodward Jr. brought her to the table. Well, um, Michelle, whoever that is, give him a raise. <laughs> Michelle and I brought like, I would say 70% of the actors to the table. And then uh, the director brought a couple and they, they all turned out to be fantastic too. But um, yeah, but my, my stepdaughter went to, you know, she came to the studio, sat down and auditioned for me and auditioned for my wife and auditioned for Tim Woodward Jr. And she like knocked it out of the park. And I was like done. And I was so proud of her. Did you have something prepared in case she didn't nail the audition? Like a, a way to break it to her that she didn't get the part? Cause I would imagine that would be pretty awkward at home. Um, you know, I, I would, I would have just been pretty blunt with her. I mean, I yeah. think that's the, um, you know, uh, uh, but she worked really hard on it. And, uh, now, you know, since we've been sort of on hiatus, she went and did a movie with Billy Zane and she's doing all this other stuff. And I'm like, when are you going to hire me? So, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's a great show, uh, for our fans that, that listen to this please really check out Studio City. It's it's really good. It's an easy to watch also. The episodes go by really quick. And the next thing you know, you're, you're sitting in front of the TV for a couple of hours because you know you just wait for the next one to come up because it loads up so quick. So I, re I really enjoyed it, man. I wish you a, a ton of success on that. Yeah, we're doing, uh, season two is gonna be expanded. We're going to do more episodes and they're gonna be longer. They're gonna be, you know, about 20 minutes each. The the uh, uh, first season of episodes were between 10 and 15 minutes. Um, and, you know, listen, it's a, it was a function of budget. You know, we made what we could afford to make. And, you know, now hopefully we're going to be able to do something bigger and better. Uh, and uh, I, I just I just read the first episode of the season uh, last night. My, I was, I'm, I'm working on a deadline for a new book that I'm doing and Michelle is writing uh, the first episode that I read it and I was just like, Hey, this is great. I mean, I just, I just twists and turns and great stuff to play. So I'm really excited about uh, filming it and, and bringing it to everybody. Have you ever had this epiphany that you need a character who's like six foot three, 350 pounds, devastatingly handsome and covered with tattoos. Where have you been? <laughs> I've been looking for, I've been <laughs> they have a trans man on the show already, Sean. <laughs> oh my God. Episode 37, finally a funny fucking joke. Jesus Christ. Wow. Speaking of funny, you know, uh, that's how Sean and I met. Um, Sean and I met doing stand-up. We were doing a, a, a few uh, Matt Bridgestone shows. And I saw you're going to be in um, AC. You want to uh, tell us about that? Yeah, uh, I'm really excited. I'm going to be headlining at the uh, Atlantic City Comedy uh, Club on Thursday, November 19th. And I got a little uh, promo code for all of your listeners. It's uh, Cobra. And it's a lot of fun. Look, I talk a lot about- Why put it on the bottom? My experience as a, a member of the Cobra Kai and what it's like to have five kids and live in Hollywood and work in soap operas. And, uh, you know, the kids seem to like it. I'm not yeah, expecting an honest answer on this one, but I have to give it a shout out anyway. Will we be seeing Mike Barnes in season three of Cobra Kai? This seems to be the eternal question. Uh, all I can say is watch and see, keep the faith. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think we've necessarily seen the last of Mike Barnes. All right, I'll have to, I'll work with that. All right. I don't understand what he's saying. I mean, could he, uh, can you give me a little bit more? <laughs> no, but, <laughs> no, but it, how's the comedy going? That's what I wanted to know about as well. How's you know, the comedy I, going? Well, I mean, listen, I mean, you know, how's the comedy been going for anybody during COVID? I mean, you know, this is, you know, you know, January 20th, January 20th of this year, I was headlining at the belly room uh, at the comedy store in Sunset. And then what, like two weeks later, we're in lockdown. So this is the first uh, first time I've performed uh, in, what is it, 11 months, right? It's oh, like, wow. 11 months, yeah. So, and I'm looking forward to it, man. I mean, I, you know, it's a, it's a big, beautiful theater. It's got 600 seats. You know, of course they can only do 25%, but, you know, just to get back out there in front of people and, and uh, you know how it is, Jeff. You know, you get out on that stage and it's it's just freeing, man. It's like you're playing and having fun. It's something I haven't done now for about 11 months, and I, I can't wait to get back out there and do it. I did about four out. I did about four outdoor gigs. One of them, the first one was actually with uh, Sean Morton, who did terrific. Uh, and then after the four outdoor gigs, which I felt all went pretty well, yeah. I had my first indoor gig 
two weeks ago at a place that I've done before. And it was so tough, man. I think I just got overwhelmed by the fact like, holy shit, like I'm, this is almost close to normal. And it really overwhelmed me. So, so was it weird though? Was it weird though? Cause like the audience was spread out or, you know, I wish I could blame it on that. I just, I think I got inside my head. I was so psyched up that I was like, oh my God, it's, it's, it's a big stage and it's a, it's a, you know, a real sound system. And then I just, I don't know. I, I actually, at one point for the first time in 14 years, I, I started to repeat a bit. I was like, oh. um, listen, but I acknowledged you know, it. And then they laughed, you know, people are very understanding, but it's tough. The it indoor, Sean, the indoor gigs are not like they were. It, it, it is weird, you know, especially out here, you can only go about 25%. So if you're in a room that seats a, a hundred, you're looking at 25 people. Like I know Eastville in the city. I mean, they're book they're booking shows. You have you're having headliners like Janine Garofalo, Mark Norman on the show. But right. you, you have an audience of eight people, twelve people. You know, but you know what? That's I mean, listen, you, you you know how good that is for you as a comic to go up there and just have to slug it out and grind. I mean, you know, it's it's like a crucible, right? Well listen, you know? we do we do it if there's eight people, if there's eight hundred people, do it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> Show must the show must go on. I'm really I'm really fortunate in 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 that a lot of my audience are either Karate Kid fans or soap opera fans, and so you know they have an instant affinity for the material. They know who I'm. You guys, this is true. I swear to God, this is true. So some guy got a tattoo of my face on the inside of his thigh, but not like this face, but like my face from Cobra Kai. I I mean from my Karate Kid. I swear to God, he got Mike Barnes face on his thigh and it turns out the guy is from like two hours away from ac and so i reached out to him and i was like look man i gotta meet you and so this guy's coming to my show so i can't wait is it matt bridgestone was it matt bridgestone who got the tattoo not matt, sounds- <laughs> not matt, no, but like if you look at the tattoo i look like this and it's like you know when you see the guy i'm like four inches from his balls and now you understand why i'm like that i mean weird but you know i guess oddly flattering i don't know I would say that's flattering. No one has a tattoo of me and they have that balls. I, you're so short. I can get a life-size tattoo of you on my back. I'm going to get a tattoo. I'm going to get a tattoo of Jeffrey Paul having lunch with Al Pacino. That's what I'm going to do. It's going to be a nice. Because he was in The Irishman. I don't know if you ever <laughs> heard that. Hey, well, listen, this film. Yo, this film, Sean, The Irishman. Sean, ha- listen, Sean ha- doesn't have a Pacino story, but he does have a, a Julie Pacino story, right? <laughs> Right. Yeah, uh, Al Pacino's daughter uh, produced a uh, a film that I was in, and uh, uh, they call him AP. When, when when you know him, it's it's AP, not Al Pacino. I never met him, but uh, <laughs> he, he this, and we actually filmed in what's the church? I think it's on Mott Street, where the, it was the Godfather Church, where where Michael no, has the his Godfather baby. Church is in Staten Island. The Godfather sure? Church is on. I, 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 I got us. Are, are you sure? And the only reason I tell you this is that Julie Pacino was actually the baby, and she said, "This is the church." I heard the you house know. was in Staten Island. I never heard the church. No, no, the house, the house, the house is on Toad Hill. The church is on Highland Boulevard. Uh, oh. I passed it every single day. Really? Okay. Yes. Well, she. I'm going to send you a picture of it. I'm going to send you it's a picture. The Mount of it. Loretto Church in Staten Island. Correct. Okay. Well, I, what's the famous church that's on, uh, I guess, Mott Street? I don't remember. The church of St. Paul's? Yeah, it's like a big, beautiful Gothic Catholic church. So, you know what's so cool? I'd never filmed in New York. I mean, I'd done, you know, like studio stuff. But we were filming on the street. And what's amazing in New York is, like, people will line up on the sidewalks once they know it's a production. And I'm doing this scene and you, know, you see all these people and you're, you're blocking them out. But at the end of the scene, you know, people are clapping and cheering and it's like, it's like a f- unbelievable rush filming there as opposed to kind of filming in Los Angeles. I had never experienced anything like it, it was a really amazing experience. Yeah. So the it movie that I was cool. in a couple of years ago when we actually shot my scene outside, uh, it was 103 degrees in Leonardo, New Jersey. And I had to wear a black t-shirt so knowing my fatness, I bought four black t-shirts. <laughs> wear them all at the same time? What's that? You wear them all at the same time? <laughs> no, I had to keep changing out because the sweat ring was going down to my belly button every time. Hey, is it Leonardo where uh, um, clerks? clerks yeah, my scene was actually shot in front of the quick stop. Yeah, what was it for? Was it for one of the Kevin Smith movies? No, it was a movie called Gone for the Weekend, which is a really horrible, terrible movie. So the original scene was supposed to have Kevin Smith in it with me, but then Uh-oh. Kevin had that massive heart attack. What an asshole, right? 
<laughs> what a shit stain. It was so selfish. bad. I went to the premiere of the movie. They had it in a huge theater, and I knew my my mark was at twenty three minutes, and yeah. I was dying up until the twenty third minute. I see my scene, and I go, "We gotta get the fuck out of here." <laughs> no, we can't leave. It's the premiere. No, we really gotta get the fuck out of here. Done that. I've done that too. Listen, we've all done uh, stinkers, believe me. Yeah. Right, so this show is called Who's Your Band, and we're like again forty minutes in, and we have not talked one lick of music. So let let before we we wrap this up, let's talk a little bit about music. And both sure. our g- guests both picked um, Jersey artists. Sean, you're a, a Springsteen fan, and Ryan Bon Jovi. Yeah, I, you know, they're, they're, I'm sorry, Sean. Go ahead, you take it. I, I uh, I'm I'm not a huge fan of Springsteen just because like I find the music to be depressing, and it's not even so much Springsteen. It's the people that live on the Jersey Shore where I live. Where any time I've ever done a gig, I've worked with Nick Clemens, the son of Clarence Clemens, and, and a bunch of other musicians. There's always people that you know buy tickets and come to the show, and it could be in support for a charity, and then they don't shut up about oh I hope Bruce will show up. Because maybe once or twice a year, Springsteen will show up at like the Wonder Bar, the Stone Pony and Asbury and do three or four songs. So it gets annoying after a while. But I always loved Bon Jovi uh, because I, the way that they've evolved, I mean, the, the guy can, you know, do the air hair metal thing. And then he did the ballad thing and the, you know, pop rock in the 90s. Then he went country. And, you know, the, everything the guy puts out winds up, you know, selling and doing well. So. I'm Bon Jovi over Bruce. It seems like Sean is Except that last album, which was complete hot garbage. Yeah, no, I agree on that one. Okay. Bon Jovi a lot was, I just read this. The guy's been married to like his high school sweetheart, right? That's right. Yeah. Dorothea. That's, I just find that very commendable. You know what I mean? It's not easy when you're in the entertainment business, and especially being a you know huge star like he is and traveling and all that to uh, sustain a marriage. So I think that probably... So they something. did break up, though, for a little while. I always read that You Give Love a Bad Name was actually written about the actress Diane Lane. And then after him and Diane Lane broke up, they wound she's, up back together. Yeah, she was in The Outsiders. Yeah, she's smoking still to this day. Oh. Still, still. I mean, yeah, for sure. So what, yeah. sure, I, why uh, Springsteen? What, what, no, what, I, all of us have a soundtrack that coincides with our adolescence. And I think, you know, when you're young like that, you're still forming your brain and you're so impressionable that when something does take root, it really takes root. You know what I mean? And it started with, I guess, a bunch of older guys that I knew that like Springsteen, they turned me on to it. And, you know, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. I mean, you know, Pittsburgh, Steel. I mean, you know, a lot of that kind of gritty blue collar sensibility that Springsteen sings about. And so, so was it the river that really brought you on? Well, I love loved the river. I love the river. I love, I love I love almost all of his stuff. Um, I love the river. Um, you know, I love Thunder Road. Um, and I and I you know I, I like his uh, I like the stuff off Born USA. Look, I even like Nebraska, which is depressing as shit. Yeah. So you know, I, I just I just really connected with it. I, I don't know why. It was always the soundtrack for road trips. Um, and, and oddly enough, I've never seen him in concert. So, well, if he moves to Australia in a few months, maybe you could uh, take a trip to the land down well, under and check him out. It's funny that you said that because there's one person here who predicted in 2016 that Trump would wind up winning. And Coulter? <laughs> now me. It was me. <laughs> it no, was- we, don't have to, we don't have to get political, but I just, you no, know, I- it, it was just something that I, I saw. Look, it, with all those debates and everything that was going on and, and the way people were reacting, now I'm not so certain that it's going to happen. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it just cracks me up whenever these celebrities will come out. I mean, look, I'm not one of those guys. I think I, I can like somebody if we have uh, differing political opinions. If I judged artists based on who they voted for, I wouldn't have very much you know, people to listen to or read about or whatever. But that whole tired, I'm going to move out of the country. I mean, come oh, yeah. on, just do it. Just do yeah. it. Like, why do you got to put it out there when we know you're not going to do it? It's it's so exactly. lame. You know, I heard something really intelligent yesterday. I was watching an old Joe Rogan podcast, and he was talking about an actress. I'm not going to say who she is. But he was saying, you know, actors and actresses are so used to being the center of attention. And now, with COVID, that, you know, they're, they're not in production and stuff. They still need to be the center of attention. So they, they take into social media to, to just, you know, vomit out their opinions on both sides of this to, to, to generate relevance. And I think that's largely true. I mean, I don't like when people say, you know, what do I care what he has to say? He's an actor. Exactly. That pisses me off too. Totally, totally agree with that. I mean, I have a right to say whatever I'm going to say as a citizen. 
you know, as a member of our republic, 100%. you know, as, as you. Um, I don't think just being an actor um, qualifies you uniquely to have any kind of, um, you know, ex extra super uh, perception of what's going on in our political system. But I mean, it, it's, it's just become so ridiculously divisive. It, it, we have got to find a way back to each other. I love that you said that though, too, because I, that always annoys me too. When it's like ever an athlete or an actor says something and people, even if it's something I disagree with, people go, Oh, just shut up and play ball. You know, you don't say that on the Facebook post of a bus driver. You don't say, you know, oh, I, go drive the okay. bus. Everyone has an opinion. That. I get that. But by the same token, you know, a bus driver is not slapping a political slogan on the outside of his bus. That's true people, too. True. People, people are, you know, Politics in the playing field has been around for ages, you know, specifically, you know, it started with Jesse Owens uh, running against the Nazis. I mean, it was politicized then. It's always been politicized. But I, I don't mind if, 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 if somebody, you know, says something about their political opinions, if they're inclined to do that. But when one way or the other, it starts getting rammed down our throat yeah. on kind of a, um, a commercial level, that's when... I have the right to say I'm tapping out. I just, I don't, you know, I watch, I'm watching a football game because I want to watch a football game. I'm not interested in your political opinions. If you want to give an interview about your political opinions, you know, off camera, that's fine. I don't want to see your statement while I'm watching the game. Well, you're, I went to see Kid only... Rock in concert, uh, I think two or three years ago. It was right after Trump got elected and, you know, lights go out, place goes nuts, opens up with his first song. It was great. Right after the first song, it was a 19 minute video a pro Trump video, Kid Rock. Oh yeah. yeah. But it wasn't like towards the middle of the show, people are going to the bathroom and getting like a beer. It was after the first song. And you know, I thought it was, I've seen Kid Rock in concert uh, that what, what I saw was Kid Rock um, slamming Jack Daniels and talking about what a bitch Pam Anderson was. That was entertaining. Yeah, exactly. That was, <laughs> it, that was like, I, give me more of this. I don't even need the music. But yeah. um, sure, you're um, not the only one that's, <laughs> He's got a right to do that, but like, I don't, like, I want to just hear your music, man. I agree. You know? Yeah, I was you know? gonna say, you're not the only one that's tapping out of, of the sports thing, because have you looked at the ratings for the NBA? I mean, yeah. I mean yeah. they are really, you know, you look at these numbers, they're down 57%, 78%, game six, 4.5 million people. I yeah, mean, but how many sports were playing all at the same time? That's the only thing I have to say to it's that. It's the I mean, finals I still. About the NBA. They're, they're, they're losing out to regular season football. I think, I, think, I think a lot of people, I mean, and I'm not going to get political here. I'm just going to say this. I think a lot of people are really pissed off about the hypocrisy that the NBA is so in bed and linked with uh, the Chinese Communist Party, which they are, because you know we're we're only a small part of their their customer base. China has what a billion, no, a couple billion people, and they are basketball fanatics. I study Mandarin, so so twice a week I have a lesson with um, you know with a, well, a Chinese woman uh, who lives there, and it's very interesting to you know. To, to talk a little bit about what's going on and uh yeah basketball is enormous there and i think a lot of people are like well you know you don't say anything about the the ethnic uyghurs that are in concentration camps you don't say anything about you know nike that uses child labor and then you come and you feel the need to uh you know lambast all of us about something else and people are just like you know what i'm out can you give us a little, can you, not to cut you off, but can you give us a little Mandarin right there? Because uh, that, that interests uh, me. Why Mandarin? Um, you know, I, I've always studied languages. I study Italian. I've, I've studied different languages. I, I, it's kind of like mental gymnastics, I guess. Plus, you know, being more or less quarantined for a long time. I'm not quarantined now, but, you know. Um, and, and I had never really used Zoom a lot. Once I figured out, wow, I can do all this stuff, um, I, I thought it was amazing. Uh, a little Mandarin. Uh, I'll say... Um, I can speak a little Chinese. It means um, Jeff Paul is a hack. <laughs> hey, uh, Jeff, what's your name? So, you know, I'm at the wow. point now where I can, I, can, I can speak some. I can read a little. I can understand some. I mean, it's, it's really weird and different, um, but I like it. So, and, and it's also the most spoken language in the world. Yeah. Well, because, yeah, cause, because of the population. That's amazing. Yeah. Exactly. So prediction for 2020 for the, uh, for the election. Yes. 
Um, my prediction, which is not based on my political beliefs or affiliation at all, is that Trump's going to win. I believe that living in California, in New York, you get a very polarized view of what the rest of the country feels because California and New York are so traditionally liberal. Um, I also don't believe that the polls are accurate because I believe a lot of people that do support Donald Trump are simply not saying that they do. I, I believe that the, um, you know, the silent majority is a, is a absolute reality. Uh, I also think a lot of it has to do with his performance tonight uh, at the debates. If he is not able to keep his cool, if he doesn't shut his mouth, and if he makes this all about Hunter Biden, which is the low hanging fruit, that, you know, he's, you know, I mean, he, he can't resist, you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, I think you could turn on a linchpin, but I think based on what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, that he's getting a much bigger percentage of the African-American vote this time. Uh, and, and that's been the monolith. The Hispanic vote as well. You know something, I'll tell you a funny thing. I went and got my hair cut today. See, see. Okay. And uh, I had a guy. I'm impressed by your hair. <laughs> Justin, yeah, look, look, look what I'm fucking rocking. Come on, stop. I, I, I'm a kill for that. I kill Sean Morton for that hair. I, um, I asked this guy, I said, listen, I, I said, you're obviously Latino. I said, what? And I said, obviously, I, I get Latinos are not a, a monolithic voting block. But among your friends, among your family, what, what are you thinking? Um, especially because you're in California, which is very liberal. And he said, no, I think Trump's going to win easily. And I was like, wow, interesting. I don't know. I love that you brought up the polling because uh, one of my favorite bits by the late great Bill Hicks, uh, he's at a comedy club and he just says to the audience, because you know, I never understand these poll numbers. He's like, by a round of applause, how many people here have ever been polled? And the audience claps and he goes, Oh, about 75%. You know, <laughs> so I've always just loved that. But the polls, I, I mean, come on, after what happened in 2016, I don't understand how anybody could, could rely on polling. If you said to the audience, you know, how many people have been fucked in the ass? I mean, how many people are going to raise their hand? They're not going to tell the truth. That doesn't mean they haven't been. It's so bad. It's so stupid. Well, the helmet nor, nor what is it? The helmet Norpath model. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. So they apparently have picked 24 out of 26 presidential elections, including 2016. And they are saying that the, uh, It'll be 362 to 176 in favor of Trump. That he has a 91% chance of re-election. Re they only show Biden winning, obviously, Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, Illinois. Uh, they show Trump winning New York State. No. Come no, on. It's, you know what? It's a, I, it's, don't, I don't see that, but. Sean, it's a lot, it's a lot upstate New York oh. is yeah. Drive upstate New York. It's nothing but Trump, Pence. Yeah, but um, there's still more people in New York City than in exactly. upstate New York. Though. It's it's even there's a and like he's like uh, Sean said, uh, it's that silent majority because you know listen, we work in New York City as, as comedians. You know, you you really don't uh, talk about it. You know, uh, I. I wouldn't, that wouldn't be the most shocking thing I've ever heard. It was, a, it was very eye opening when I saw that. I was, I was really blown away by the whole, uh, by the whole statistic. I think that he's got his base, which is so loyal to him. Now, granted, his base is, he can't win with just his base. But, you know, no matter what you think about it, the fact that he's getting this third justice um, confirmed is like, you know, mana from heaven for his base. So he has delivered everything that they could have hoped for. So he's got that lock. And the fact that, you know, he touts that he has uh, had the lowest unemployment for African-Americans, he's, you know, he's uh, signed a bill for uh, uh, historically black colleges and for prison reform and all of that. Apparently, he has now garnered a bigger um, block of, of the black voting base. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I Listen, I just hope that whoever wins that there is not this bullshit carnage in the street. You know, this is, this is crap where, you know, you can't say who you're voting for. And, you know, I mean, you, you have to be afraid. I mean, that the essence of America is that we have the right to exercise our religious beliefs and that we can vote for who we want. And that ain't what it's like right now. It ain't free speech in the United States. I don't care what anybody says. No, you know what? And right. you know what? We also have a multi-tiered justice system. You know, we have a justice system where black people frequently are not treated as well. And we got a system where people that are not of the 
Clinton upper echelon are not treated the same. And it's like, this has, this has to stop, you know? I agree. Do you think that no matter who wins, people look at the media different from that? Absolutely. On? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I think here's the interesting thing. For me, I notice that I now get the, the majority of my news information from independent news sources on YouTube. Because, you know, you guys probably know this, but years ago, there were probably like 20 different corporations that owned the major newspapers and networks. And now there are six major conglomerates that own all of the news sources. I think it's like there's Comcast and there's, I, get, I forget what they are, but there's like six. Yeah, I think and, ABC Universal owns Comcast now too. It's crazy. Is that, okay, yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, basically, you know, there's this, there's this movie called Payback with uh, um, Mel Gibson. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Yep. And he's, 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 trying to, he's trying to get some money that was stolen from him. And he starts going up the food chain, killing people. And he makes this statement that's true. He goes, sooner or later, it stops with one guy. And there's one guy who has the ability to say yes or no. And sooner or later, in these multinational, publicly traded conglomerations, there's one guy who says, this is the agenda that we're actuating. And um, it's so obvious what each news outlet what their agenda is. I mean, obviously, Jeff Bezos, you know, owns the Washington Post. Um, uh, Rupert Murdoch owns Fox and the Wall Street Journal. You know what I mean? So, you know, they, they, they basically uh, stay within the parameters of what their mandate is with, with varying degrees of craziness. I think some of these interesting news outlets uh, that aren't news, news outlets on the uh, internet and on YouTube that don't have those kind of um, constraints are are reporting some very interesting stuff. Uh, and, that, and that's kind of where I've been looking lately. I think on that note, uh, listen, we're gonna thank you guys, man. Uh, this was tremendous. We, we could have done this for another hour. Absolutely. I love talking to you guys. This was awesome, man. Was hey, listen, I, I, know there's, I know there's no chance of this, but got to be great if any of you guys could come to the show in Atlantic City. Love to say hi to you. And uh, I'm only I, about an hour away. I might have to, I might take uh, up on that. <laughs> Oh, I haven't yeah. seen Matt Bridgestone in a long time, so it'd be nice to well, catch up. What's that Matt Bridgestone too. show, right? Matt Bridgestone. Is that Emilio's show? Yeah, it's Emilio Savon. Yeah. Is that his... Oh, yeah, I thought yeah. Matt was in AC Comedy Club. Yeah, I'm sorry. He's a real nice yeah. guy. So, yeah, I'm doing that, and then the, uh, the next two days, uh, I'm involved with the um, uh, National Martial Arts Championships that are also in Atlantic City. So nice. it's, cool. I'm going to be there all weekend. But you guys, thank you so much. I appreciate it. No um, problem, man. We, we're so happy to have you. Be well, you and your families, and uh, I really hope we can do this again. Thank you. ACComedyClub.com to get your tickets for the show. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care, Sean. And Ryan, what, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on What's Instagram on? at Ryan Mark Comedy. It's, it's funny. I've been doing a lot more with the, the uh, Instagram story where I take jokes that I write on Facebook, my statuses, and I post them on Instagram because I've noticed lately that a lot of people uh, under the age of uh, 30 aren't really using Facebook anymore. So uh, that's been pretty cool. I've been, uh, you know, interacting with that. And I've got the podcast on Facebook Live, uh, Kicking at Cobra Kai, which is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, my co-host, PJ Wendell, and I, we take two episodes of the show, break it down. And uh, that's basically it, man. Just grinding it out, getting new to this whole podcast thing. I thank you guys for having me. This was so much fun. Yeah, and listen, Ryan is a great, great follow on social media. Your take on things are, I think, are well thought out. I mean, I mean, I'd always agree with you, but I always respect what you have to say. Well, I, I appreciate you that. Say. You know, real quick story, real quick. I'm not one of the things that you always see on Facebook, right, is, is people say, oh, well, you know, you're not going to change anyone's mind. And I kind of have to disagree with that. I, uh, there's a comic. You guys probably know him. Thomas Dale. He's out in L.A. now. He's sure, from Long Island. Mm -hmm. What's that? Of course. Yeah. So I and I always use this uh, reference. And it actually got back to Thomas Dale not that long ago. And, and you know, he talked to me about it. I remember a status I had posted years ago. There was a news story that broke out about how the Boy Scouts of America were going to allow homosexual boys to join the Boy Scouts. And I'm not talking scout masters or whatever. It was going to be the boys themselves. And I remember making a post going like, is this a little too much? I had shared the article where I was like, you know, is this a bit too much that we're, we're, we're putting sexual identities on these children? And I was like, I think it's ridiculous. And then Thomas Dale jumped in. 
And he said to me, he goes, well, when you were in kindergarten, did you have a girlfriend? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you know, was there a girl that you had a crush on? And then when you went home, your parents said, oh, Ryan, do you have, do you have a girlfriend? And I was like, well, well, yeah, you know, that happened. He goes, okay. He goes, imagine being five years old and knowing that you didn't like Amanda, that you liked Paul. He goes, you didn't know what sex was. He goes, you just knew that you were attracted to the same sex. And everyone's telling you that that's not how it's supposed to be. And that opened my mind. And I said, holy shit, you know, uh, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to not take the status down or the post down, but actually have an engaging conversation in the comments. And I miss that about social media. I feel like that existed more about 10 years ago than it does now. Now it's this pissing contest between people. Uh, comedians, I understand like you want to get your jokes and stuff, but there's no actual conversation in threads anymore. Everyone just has their agenda and they put it out and it drives me nuts. hundred percent. Right. A hundred percent. Right. My whole thing I, with I the whole boy overall, scout thing now, if you've seen on Facebook, it's the big pictures that say with, with the three fingers. And it's like, if you, if you uh, were a boy scout and you were molested and I texted my friend, I go, well, look, if they're taking three fingers, they should probably get a little bit of money. You know what? I started seeing those all the time too. And after watching that, uh, social dilemma thing, I thought, it was because I've been making a lot of jokes about my Catholic school upbringing. Oh, I thought so it was because you're like, always putting three fingers in your ass when you're on Facebook. Thank you. So <laughs> I was like, you know, is is are they sending me like you know Boy Scout sexual assault class action suits because I'm talking about the Catholic Church and they're one and the yeah. same? It's Who knows? Crazy shit, dude. Sean, where can people find you? Oh, uh, let's see. Let's let's, let's, let's plug some shows. I actually have some shows coming up. November seventh in Bloomfield. We're almost sold out already. Uh, November 13th and 14th, Bananas Comedy Club, Hasbrook Heights. November 20th and 21st, uh, Comedy Zone in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Beautiful. All right, guys. This wraps up another Who's Your Band podcast, man. This was a great one. Thank you. And we so talked much about music. We, we, we talked music for about a good four minutes. Oh, so, what? Yeah, oh, there's been other episodes where we haven't even gotten that much into most it? Most of them. <laughs> So we had an idea, we had a concept, you know, we don't always follow through. <laughs> you know what? I, I feel like people, it's funny, like, unless you're, you know, and I remember talking to you, Jeff, about like, oh yeah, go into these groups and, and do stuff. People just want to laugh and have fun. Like, I mean, unless there's like real diehards, I'm sure if you have somebody that's like, you know, from a certain band, the fans of that band are going to, yeah, but people just yeah, like we've had, call, we had like Matt Pinfield on, we've had, uh, the oh, he's awesome. Gold beat. We've had a uh, guitar player from soul flies. So we've had some, we had Billy Vera on Billy Vera from, uh, that's awesome. Billy Robert Vera Tepper. They, yeah. Robert Tepper we had on. No, that's, uh, we had that, Mitch that's Malloy fantastic. from great white. Recently. That's true. He was fun. And did you also notice that the guys from, uh, uh, sons of silver, they sponsored, uh, a, post and yes. all over social media for us so these guys are really good so yeah we talk plenty of music on the show but sometimes we love to have guys like sean and yourself on and just kind of like kick it and that's what's great about this show no i'm so, we so got glad another... you guys had me thank you anytime a pleasure and we have uh, more coming up so guys watch the show share the show give us a like and we appreciate all that and until next week take care everybody take care sean ryan we'll see you, see later. you later later on guys